Thanks so much, Natalie. All of us at Berkeley Judicial Institute are so proud to be part of this effective communication across differences or ECAD program for law students. We are delighted that so many of you are interested in learning a little bit more about the program. Forgive a very quick Berkeley Judicial Institute advertisement. Now that we have you here, we'd love to have more of you. Natalie will put in our uh, in the chat a little more about Berkeley Judicial, but check out our website where you can see uh, registration links for future programs, recordings of past programs, join our mailing list, follow us on Twitter. Advertisement over and forgive me, but such a great group, I couldn't help it. Uh, we will move to the main event. Effective communication across differences is the brainchild of the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society. Today, you'll hear from the program architects and from some of the talented judges and faculty who brought that beautiful idea to fruition. Our goals for today, we want to tell you a little bit more about ECAD. We want to wow you with the talent of the ECAD faculty. We want to encourage those eligible to apply for the program and encourage others to share news about the program. Most important, we want your questions answered. If you have questions, please use the chat feature and we will either have the answer spontaneously or research them and, and find out for you. One other um, housekeeping rule, we could spend our entire time together talking about how wonderful our faculty are because they truly are. I'm going to ask you to take it as a matter of faith. I know that's tough for lawyers, but please take it as a matter of faith. When faculty are introduced, Natalie will put their a link to their biographies into the chat so that you can learn more. So toward that end, I will introduce our first faculty. Robin Lipsky serves as executive director to the Ninth Judicial Historical Society. And it was her inspiration that created this beautiful program. Robin, can you tell us a little bit about ECAD? Thank you so much, Denise, for that lovely introduction and welcome to you all. I'm Robin Lipsky and I am the Executive Director of the Ninth Circuit's Historical Society. And we're one of the partners for this amazing series, Effective Communications Across Differences. And we're so glad that you could all join us today. As a historical society, we are well aware that differences of opinion are not a new phenomenon nor are they in, in any way a negative thing. Throughout history, disagreement has been an essential catalyst for change and growth, both for individuals and for us as a nation. But somewhere along the way as a nation, we seem to have become more fractured, less able to hear and to abide opinions of others that diverge from our own on issues we rightly care about deeply. And college campuses and law schools although they should be laboratories for testing new thoughts and ideas, are not immune to this discord. And that is where you all come in. I'm only the administrator of this program. So unlike the incredible facilitators and the judges you'll hear from in a few moments, I'm not the one who makes the magic happen here. And magic it is indeed. In our last cohort, 100% of the participants reported having an actual experience of communicating across a difference. And I know some of you law students already are going to feel pressured by that, but let me reassure you, no pressure to those of you who may join us next time. You're in amazing hands and it will happen. So what else will happen? You may ask, well, let's see. First, you'll have the absolute privilege of hearing from and interacting with a variety of federal circuit and district court judges. They have different backgrounds, they come from different parts of the Ninth Circuit, they were appointed by different presidents, but they all bring a willingness to share with you their authentic experiences of navigating disagreements in their professional lives. I'm so humbled by their enthusiastic support for this series and the time they take out of their incredibly busy lives to make it and you a priority. And I think the takeaway of their participation is the value that they see in this program for you as individuals and for the health of the legal community. And you'll also have the guidance and support of some of the most impressive and experienced facilitators you'll ever be lucky enough to interact with. I don't get to be in the Zoom room with your small groups while you work with them. So I can't tell you how they do it, 
but I know from speaking with students who were with the facilitators who will lead you so thoughtfully through this series that you will come out with a greater appreciation of the way you communicate. You will have insights into how you can improve, how improved communication happens and also hands-on opportunities to put that new knowledge into practice. You really can't overestimate the value and importance of what you will learn here for your time at law school, your legal practice, and also in your personal relationships. Let me just end here with a story that I probably should have shared at the beginning uh, to explain part of the genesis of this program. Back in 2017, the Supreme Court decided a case called Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission. You may or may not remember this case, but the issue before the court was very roughly whether Colorado law could compel a baker to make a wedding cake for a gay couple when the baker argued that making the cake would violate his sincerely held religious beliefs about same-sex marriage. The day after that case was argued at the Supreme Court, I attended a continuing legal education panel with one of the lawyers who had argued for the baker and another lawyer who had represented the same, a same-sex couple in a similar case brought against a florist. And as these two men spoke, it was clear that they had taken these cases because they each sincerely believed in the ideal that these cases represented. And I can tell you that despite these strongly held and genuine beliefs, their conversation, and that's what it was. It wasn't an argument or an attempt to browbeat or convince the other person of how wrongheaded their position was. It was truly a respectful conversation, ended with the two of them later at the bar having a drink together. And that, my dear friends, is what I want for all of you, because that ability will make your personal and professional lives so much more fulfilling and our communities so much stronger. And here is the place to help you learn how to make that happen. And now I'll turn the program over to Judge Fogel. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> and I think Robin is way too modest when she says she's only the administrative uh, force here. This program and I think her comments uh, reflect a, a, a tremendous vision and a really beautiful vision of what's possible between people. So thank you, Robin, for uh, bringing us together. Um, I'm currently the director of uh, the Berkeley Judicial Institute. I've been doing that for about three and a half years. Um, and um, before that, I was a judge for 37 years in the state and was the director of the Federal Judicial Center, which is the uh, educational and research uh, arm of the federal judiciary. Um, this topic of um, how you communicate across differences is really important. It's important to our society. Uh, it's important to uh, our, I think, our survival, our thriving as a society at this point in time. Um, it's also very important to us as lawyers and judges. Uh, and when we talk about um, communicating across differences, it's not just being nice to people or listening to people and then dismissing what they have to say. It's much more integrative than that. It's, it's really trying to understand somebody else. I mean, why someone else sees the world differently from you. And uh, you don't have to end up agreeing with them. But I think part of the skill set that we're trying to impart is learning the skills that help you understand somebody else and help you get a sense of what someone else's perspective is so you can actually have a, a real conversation with them. So it's not superficial niceness. It's really learning how to talk to people, and listen to people. And I think we put the emphasis on listen to people uh, whose view of the world is different from yours, even about very, very deeply held beliefs. Uh, <clears throat> we thought it would be very important to have uh, judges uh, model that. Um, we asked around, we did a lot of research and said, who are the judges in the Ninth Circuit who model that quality, that attribute of being able to communicate effectively across differences? We got uh, some really great feedback about that. And we've been extraordinarily lucky that we have identified judges uh, from across the aisle, as Robin said, from a variety of backgrounds and, and philosophies who all have that talent. They're all seen as their colleagues, by their colleagues and by people who've appeared before them uh, as people who embody uh, this ability to really listen in a, in a thoughtful and, and uh, sincere way and to communicate that way too. Um, two of the judges who <clears throat> were part of our faculty for the first um, 
iteration of this program, which we offered uh, during the winter, uh, are judges Bridget Beatty and Johnny Rawlinson. They're both uh, judges on the Ninth Circuit, and they're with us tonight. Um, and I want to thank both of them for joining us. I think they're very good uh, embodiments of what this program is about. And I'd like to ask each of you, uh, from having done the first program and having uh, seen what, what happened and contributed to it as, as much as you did, why, why should the people who are listening to this uh, program tonight, why should, they, why should they be involved in this program? Why is it worth taking the time uh, to learn to communicate effectively across differences? And I'll, I'll start with Judge Beatty. Well, thank you, um, Judge Vogel, and um, uh, thank you to uh, Robin Lipsky for inviting me to participate in the program uh, the first go around and to talk about it tonight. Um, why should you participate in this program? I think Judge Vogel just touched on this. It's incredibly important for us as a society to coexist with our differences and to be civil with each other. And I think you can approach um, civility is either a matter of principle or pragmatism. So you either do this because this is how you have learned through your life to treat other people and you bring those um, lessons into your adult interactions and you strive to be civil and respectful and decent as a matter of principle because you think it is the right thing to do. Um, but if that is not something that guides your conduct, then you can view civility just as a good practice and something that is beneficial for you. Um, there are two examples um, of, I think, of these approaches that come to mind for me. When I joined the Ninth Circuit, um, my colleagues, many of my new colleagues, called me, sent me notes, they emailed me, they came to visit me. They were warm and cordial and welcoming and extremely kind, and they went out of their way to welcome me to the court. Um, and I think that that emanated from their character and how they view, um, how they think it is uh, appropriate to interact with colleagues, um, even if it's somebody with whom you might disagree on very important issues. The second approach was one of my colleagues said to me, um, we're going to be colleagues for life, and so you want to be my friend. And I think the implication of that statement is, yes, we are together for life, and it's going to be much easier for you, and you're going to have a much better time of it if you learn to play well with others and get along. Um, and so it could be in your own best interest to be civil and cordial. Um, and I think you should treat people with respect, and you should approach new situations with humility because it's the right thing to do. But I also think it's in your best interest. I don't know of anyone who ever lost a job or a case um, or a significant contact because they were too polite and respectful. And I think it makes you not only a better person, but a better lawyer, particularly as it gives you the ability to understand somebody else's position. And even if you need to understand it, just so you can counter it. And I think these sessions, um, provide opportunities for you to talk about these things with people from various backgrounds and different experiences um, and people who often work in very contentious situations, lawyers and judges and mediators. And I, I don't think it's um, a small thing that you get to spend a significant amount of time with professional circuit mediators who are extraordinarily good at what they do and really understand effective communications and bridging um, differences. And then, um, uh, of course, I think it's fun in these smaller groups when the uh, participants, the students, the judges, the lawyers, the mediators all just get to talk about a, a topic and uh, ask questions and interact. So um, I, I would say those are the reasons that you should do it. It's a pretty unique experience. I really wish I'd had it in law school. And I remember years after I graduated from law school thinking, I wish I'd known when I was graduating and starting my career that at some point my opposing counsel we're going to be references because that is true. And you end up listing those people. I listed them. I had to list them on my application to be an assistant United States attorney, to be a magistrate judge, and to go through the confirmation process. And so um, you have to list all the cases you worked on, who the lawyers were, and those people get contacted and ask about you. And so you really don't want to be a person that people are just waiting to take the claws out and dig into you because you were so horrific to them. 
you want to be a decent person because it's the right thing to do, but also it is in your best interest. Thank you so much, Judge Beatty. Um, and if you want to see more of Judge Beatty, then you just need to sign up for the program because she'll be on the <laughs> first panel uh, uh, that's be, uh, featuring appellate judges uh, this coming August. So I'm going to turn to Judge Rollinson. Um, so what would you uh, say in response to the same, same question? Yes, and I would like to also thank you all for the opportunity to participate the first time and this time. It was a very rewarding experience for me. And as was mentioned, I happened to run into two of the students who participated in the first module and they were raving about the experience and how insightful it was and how it really enhanced their, their law school studies. And that's one of the things I think is really important for students who are contemplating participating to understand is that as you are navigating your way through law school, the things you learn here will help you to even be a better student because it helps you to understand a different perspective. And that's always useful when you're trying to digest uh, complicated information and try to um, make sense of all of that. So I think it's really important to know that the perspective that you get from these presentations will help you as you navigate law school. And also when you finish law school, there are very few people in our profession who work alone. It's the fact of our profession that we all have to work with someone else, whether it's a client, whether it's a supervising attorney, whether or not it's someone, one of your colleagues. That was one of the biggest differences for me of being a trial judge and being an appellate judge. When I was a trial judge, I consulted myself and came to a decision. But once I became an appellate judge, there are three of us on the panel and you have to convince at least one other person to go along with your um, suggested re resolution of the case. And that is much more um, easy to do if you have the ability to discuss in a civil manner and resolve any differences that may be um, apparent among the, the, the panel members. And that's one of the things that was really such a pleasant surprise to me going into the Ninth Circuit, because as was mentioned, we come from different political perspectives. We come from different law schools. We come from different walks of life. We come from different geographical parts of the country. And we all bring those experience into our position as judges. And all of that goes into play when we're discussing the outcome of a case. One of the things that I have noticed lately with my colleagues that has really been impressive to me is we have this process called on um, bonk. And that's when one of our decisions comes out and an, an off panel judge disagrees with that, they have the opportunity to call the case on bonk to try to convince other judges on the court to look at the case again that the three judge panel has decided. And sometimes when the case is called on bonk, one of the members of the panel will ask the judge who is making the en banc call, is there anything we can do to satisfy your concerns so we don't have to take the case en banc? And to me, that's just the perfect example of how to resolve conflict before it becomes real conflict. And so that same mentality to me is something that's being um, fostered in these discussions. And it's a real talent to be able to do that. And so I think it, it would behoove any student who has the opportunity to take advantage of these life skills to do so. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and Judge uh, Rollinson will be joining us in August as well. Uh, and we are very grateful to her for that. She brings a, a, a lot of perspective, long service on, on the uh, federal courts uh, and, and in practice before that. What's interesting, I mean, listening to both the judges is, you know, they really don't have any hesitation in saying how important these skills are, how important it is to be able to be collegial with people you disagree with. And, uh, but it's not just a matter of having good intentions. It's not just a matter of wanting to do it. That's actually important. But there's, there's actually a skill set. There's actually things you can learn how to do that make it easier for you to have those kinds of conversations. And, you know, Judge Rollins just gave a really good example, you know, asking, asking questions. Is there anything we can do? Is you know what what is it that that we missed in the panel decision that would would, would uh, we could address that might because on bond decisions as the judges know are can be pretty contentious and divisive. So 
so it's it's there's a skill set. There's some very granular, concrete skills that enable a person who wants to be civil, who wants to be collegial, to do that. And that's really what this program is about. It's not just sort of cheerleading for 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 being nice to other people or being being kind to other people, but it's it's teaching you how to have conversations with people. You may have fundamental disagreements about things that are really important to you. And that's one of the things we've tried to do in designing the curriculum is find uh, topics that are like that, where, where people really see them differently and they're matters of moral principle or matters of, of deeply held beliefs of one kind or another and figuring out how to talk about them. And Coach we're really, Paul, yes, go ahead, Judge Roland, please. Go. One of the things that I noticed over time was yeah. when I was expressing disagreement with someone rather than saying, I think you're wrong or I disagree with you. Yeah. I would end with, am I, what am I missing? Right. And that way you're not saying that someone is wrong, but you're just saying, I, I perceive this differently. Tell me what, why it is that I have a different perspective from your perspective. What am I missing that, that I should know? Right. And that's a, that's a technique. That's a skill. And I want to, I want to introduce our, 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 the people who are the real masters of the process um, in this in this program. They're, they're all uh, three deeply experienced mediators um, who have worked in the courts and outside of the courts, uh, resolving very, very thorny problems between people and teaching other people how to do the same thing. So we have three of our four faculty with us tonight. Um, and one of Howard Herman will explain where our fourth person is. But, uh, but let me introduce uh, the three mediators who are with us uh, this evening, uh, Howard Herman, um, who was formerly the uh, director of the uh, ADR program for the Northern District of California, and now is a mediator in private practice, and uh, Damaris Evans, who is a mediator uh, in, in private practice in, in Alameda County, and um, Amrita Malik, who is uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion director for the Ninth Circuit and also uh, an, a very experienced me mediator. And uh, Howard, I'm gonna go directly to you um, and you can explain where our fourth person is and, and talk a little bit about what you all are gonna be doing. Thank you so much, Judge Fogel. Um, <clears throat> our fourth um, uh, mediator facilitator is Claudia Bernard. And unfortunately she is recovering from COVID and she sends her regrets um, is unable to join us this evening. Um, Claudia is the former as was formerly the Chief Circuit Mediator at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, now an independent mediator and consultant in the, in the Bay Area. Um, I, I wanted to um, say a few words about the structure of what we'll be doing, uh, the two components of the program that are really the responsibility of the mediators and facilitators um, who will be, who'll be working with you. And really, the judges have already uh, focused us in on, the, uh, 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 on, on these various components, but let me just dig in a little bit deeper. There are really two aspects of the work that you'll be doing with the facilitators. The first is a communications workshop component, which really does drill down on the things that the judges have just mentioned. We'll be working to develop your skills on how to listen attentively and really develop the skill of listening to another person to learn from that person, not just to find the faults in their arguments and dissect what the other person is saying, but really to try to listen for real learning and understanding. The next component is about asking good questions. There really is a skill to, to finding um, what to ask and how to, how to go about approaching asking questions that, again, promote understanding and learning as opposed to cross-examining to make your own point. So, um, and there, there's, there's a, it's a different way of questioning than lots of the rest of our legal education leads us to. So we'll be dissecting a bit the process of asking questions, different kinds of questions and how best to go about that. And then finally, there's the question of asserting yourself. How do you assert yourself when you have big disagreements in a way that's not disagreeable, um, in a way that allows us to speak really productively in order to be understood, figuring out ways to say things to someone who disagrees with us in a way that promotes that other person actually hearing what we're saying. 
so that you can develop um, true understanding and connection. So some portion of our time together will be spent really workshopping these three different components of communication and building skills. Um, then a great deal of our time will be spent in small group um, dialogues where we actually will provide you a real opportunity to gather with people who hopefully have some, certainly will have some differences. They'll be from different law schools, from different um, geographic regions, and we'll do our best to assemble groups in which there will be disagreements um, uh, of opinion as well, and actually have real conversation, real practice in, in learning how to talk respectfully across, um, across our differences. Um, so I'm going to turn now to um, my colleagues and let them talk a little bit more depth about um, their perceptions of the small groups, how they went before, and, um, and, and, and how they see um, this process. And so I'll turn first to Damaris. Thanks so much, Howard. Um, and greetings, everyone. Thanks for having me um, also in this program today. So uh, this was really uh, such a enlightening experience. And it was such an honor to be with both the judges and the students. And one of the things that I found and noticed in our small practice groups uh, throughout the uh, series was how much the students sort of evolved just in the period of time that we were all together. Um, it, was, it was really quite uh, fascinating to see. And, um, you know, to see the initial sort of hesitance to express views that may have been controversial um, or that folks may disagree with. So even though that's sort of the topic of this training, communicating across difference, it's sort of part of the normal, you know, sort of human behavior to not want to be, you know, critiqued or disagreed with or criticized or, you know, to get things wrong to have, you know, folks disagree with you. So that, that was very clear um, when we started out that if folks had uh, views that were they may have even thought were divergent. There was a hesitance to sort of speak views that um, might have possibly been critiqued. And so as the sessions progressed and we had an opportunity and students had an opportunity to listen to judges talk about their experiences doing these things and then to practice um, in our small groups doing this uh, speaking and listening as, as Howard described and to learn about this phenomenon, this you know, very natural phenomenon, uh, almost in each session, uh, students became more and more vocal until towards the last session, you know, students were you know, literally saying, I'm just gonna put it all out there. You know, I'm just gonna lay it on the line <laughs> kind of thing. And so you, know, you could clearly see this sort of evolution of you know, just opening up um, and, and being willing to uh, to say things much more than in the first session. And so um, this is this this practice and this this learning, the, the skills that are that are being developed um, is helping in both ways, uh, helping us to see how we judge ourselves, you know, how we sort of self-censor, self-censor, how we critique ourselves, and, and how we may do that to others. And so, you know, through looking at both of those, it allows us to be more open. And then there's other techniques that, um, you know, we use to determine whether we're doing that, you know, observing our body language, our breathing, our mind chatter, all of these different things to determine whether or not we're, you know, judging ourselves or judging others. And so I think, you know, as Howard said, going through this learning and practicing and hearing others' experiences enhance greatly both skill sets, both listening and speaking, um, and, and gave folks an opportunity to see that only by really being able to deeply listen to um, what others are saying, particularly others who you don't agree with and who you may have some judgment, 
but only by really deeply listening to them will you develop the ability to speak into um, their listening, to speak to them in a way that they can hear what you have to say. That's very different from what they may have said, or you know, maybe expressing a very different belief system or point of view or something like that. So it enhances um, both of those skill sets in a, in a way that just allows folks to be much more effective in you know, not just work and school and, you know, other kind of relationships, but, um, you know, you're actually enhanced in, in, in innumerable ways. So I just, I, I thought it was a really enlightening experience. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to our other colleague who was uh, doing small group sessions, and that's Amrita. Thank you, Damaris. So I'll confess that I asked to go last because I knew I couldn't say it better than everyone who came before. So I'm in the privileged position of saying, yes, I heartily agree with everything you've already heard. I actually wanted to specifically pick up on a theme that Judge Rawlinson shared with us and that observation that the ECAD program provides a really beautiful complement to your legal studies. Law schools pride themselves on training you to think like a lawyer, right? Very important skill set, very specific skill set. And I could see in my own small group that my students came in very determined to be lawyers. And at the start, you know, had very pointed arguments or a real desire to persuade and sometimes even adopting positions that perhaps weren't even really theirs. But then over the course of the program, as they developed new skills, new ways of thinking, new ways of approaching communication, you could see a real beautiful shift and a willingness to be more open to ask open-ended questions, to seek information, to do that information gathering rather than to come in focused, very kind of laser-like on what is relevant or what is not, but have a broader sense of what relevant could be. And really the beautiful thing there too is that it, it gives you the opportunity to really interrogate what you think you believe, right? To really question, where is this coming from? Why is this important to me? What is this grounded in? What are my values here? What does this say about who I am and who I might wanna be? And am I open to thinking about this in a different way? Is there something a colleague could share with me that might help broaden my thinking or my approach? And, you know, I found in my group, it was really inspiring to me to see these students open in that way and to confront things that perhaps they didn't think were that important only to find that they really were or vice versa. And again, that the real, the word I want to use is irony, but it's not irony. It's actually just a beautiful surprise that guess what? That actually helps you think like a lawyer that will improve your legal abilities, that helps you do that information gathering, think broadly, better understand other points of view to really sharpen your own advocacy and your own ability to express where you are coming from. As Howard put it also, to assert yourself in a way that is grounded and meaningful and responsive. So all of that was a real privilege to see my students explore. It was um, a wonderful education for me as well. And for those of you who are on the, offense, on the fence about this, I mean, do it, right? One of the other things I'll share in my last small group after the final judges panel, you know, we started with a conversation like, well, you got your money's worth because hearing these judges talk so candidly, so openly about their experiences, their perspectives, and to model what effective communication across difference looks like, that's an opportunity you're not going to get um, really in, in a very easy way. So take advantage of that and really benefit from the access that you're going to get from these brilliant thinkers and the ways that they engage with conflict as well. So one of the things we promised to do was wow you with the people who are the ECAD faculty. And while I haven't done evaluations and polls, I think we achieved that. Um, I wanted to encourage anyone who's got questions to please put them in the chat, but, um, Robin, first, I hope you're feeling duly proud that this idea you came up with has led to these beautiful testimonials. Can you tell us a little more about evaluations you've received uh, from the program? Yes, thank you so much, Denise. Um, and I will have to say, I, I was the one who maybe started the ball rolling, but you can see that from all of these people that this idea was so resonant with everybody about the importance of these skills and the um, importance of helping people who are coming behind us in the legal profession 
develop them. And for that, I am, again, unbelievably grateful to this incredible team of people who really have all made this happen. And I hope to include people who are watching uh, us and the team going forward to help spread the message further. Because one of the things that the law student said to us um, not only was that the uh, workshop was certainly among one of the best they had ever attended, and that they thought that the seminar should actually be part of orientation for law school, um, was that they were already putting the skills that they had learned in this program into practice as law students, um, and that they had were sharing that not just with their fellow students, but with their professors, and that the skills and um, abilities that they had learned in this process were really resonating already back on their campuses and that they couldn't wait to encourage more students to join the program in the future. Um, specifically, they said that they had felt welcomed and encouraged and that they were so glad to have been able to participate um, and that the small group time with the judges was genuinely awe-inspiring, which you know anybody already who has listened to, um, the, to Judge Rawlinson and Judge Beatty with us today will even just get the nearest glimpse of, and there's a lot more of that coming. So that's what the students um, told us uh, about their experiences, um, both in questionnaires and in one-on-one -on -one sessions that we had with them afterwards. So I, I just want to happy add to a answer any questions. Thirty-second follow-up to that. Um, Denise um, produced a, another BJI program for judges that we did um, a couple months ago, and uh, we had judges from all over the country participating in the program, and even some international judges. and And this topic came up. And one of the judges actually made a comment afterwards, and she was saying that to the point that it ought to be part of the law school curriculum, um, that, that she wished it had been something she learned in law school, and that it was harder to learn it on the job. And this was a judge who I think was very much oriented that way and really wants to be um, um, civil and engaged with, with, with colleagues. But she said that, that it would have been great if she had a running start in learning those skills. Thank you, Judge Fogel. And I did want to just mention specifically what um, one of the students shared with us and why we're opening this program this year also to incoming law students was um, he pointed out that law students are figuring out or are trying to figure out how to be law students. I mean, before you can even figure out how to be a lawyer, you have to figure out how to be a law student and that this program would really help people in trying to understand what they wanted their law school experience to be and to get the most out of that experience. So that I think we're all finding that the earlier you have these in your lives, that you have these skills, the, the happier and better off you'll be. Robin, let me ask, there's a question. Um, this questioner is wondering if this would be a suitable for a rising 1L starting in fall of 2022, or would it be better to wait until the summer before 2L? No, we, we really are encouraging incoming law students to do this now because uh, you have a moment in time where you can really focus on these skills. You're able to then take everything you've learned right into your first year of law school, which I think many people find to be a challenging year anyway. Um, and the better prepared you are uh, going in, I think the better your law school experience will be. And the Law School Admissions Council also very much shared that view and is trying to encourage all incoming rising uh, law students to join us. So we're very much looking for applications from incoming law students. And am I correct, Robin, that, that you anticipate a class that has 1Ls, 2Ls, 3Ls perhaps in the mix? Yes, we're welcoming all, all levels of students. Okay, great, great. That's the only question in the chat. Uh, since I've got you, I wanna remind you that applications are due June 24th, but they're happily accepted before that. Yes, you could apply this very evening. Uh, the programs themselves will be July 28th, August 2nd, August 4th, August 9th, and August 11th from six to eight. And while, well, um, I worry because the testimonials from the judges and the mediators who participated in this program were uniformly so glowing. Um, I wonder if you thought, oh, does she have something on them? That's what, but no, these are their genuine beliefs. They, these are the busiest people on earth who have dedicated their limited time to um, helping helping the law school uh, community grow. I'm so grateful to them. I'm 
don't have any questions, I want to especially thank uh, Natalie, who in addition to all the wonderful things she does, when Judge Fogel mentioned the program uh, that we had, the uh, Berkeley Law and the Judiciary Program, Natalie just put that in our uh, in the post. Oh, we have one more question before. Are there a limited number of students who will be accepted, Robin? Uh, yes, we are limited because we want everyone to have a, a wonderful small group experience. And so we are looking for a cohort of 20. So I'm anticipating that following this program, there'll be, be a deluge of applications. Uh, just the people we were lucky enough to encounter tonight give you a feel uh, and sense of what a student would be lucky enough to uh, experience during the program itself. So Robin, you're, you're our fearless leader. If it's, good, if it's good with you, shall we, uh, shall we adjourn for the evening? I would move to adjourn, but I would also say that if anyone has any questions about the program, they should certainly feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll be happy to try to answer any of your questions. And I do have one more, forgive me. With such a broad intent to push the program out for applicants, how does that balance it against a small cohort? Why not more cohorts? Um, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Uh, right now, we only have the bandwidth for 20. Um, this is part of a grant program that, that is uh, part of the Federal Judges Association sponsoring, but we are certainly hopeful to expand this program beyond that limited number because we certainly think that the more people who can take advantage of it, the better. So right now we're in a rollout phase, um, but we are very optimistic that within the next year or two that this will program will be much more broadly available and and even more so i think <clears throat> the idea of it being part of law school curriculum this is the incubator for something like that you know it's like where you really get a chance to to figure out how to teach this stuff to, to law students and and it's very good to have all of you who are interested in participating to, to hone that so that future generations of law students, future groups of law students can, I mean, this, this, I mean, my belief is this ought to be part of the basic stuff you learn in law school, how to, how to communicate and how to listen. And so we're kind of working at, at that skill development uh, with, with the future in mind. And Robin, how are students selected for the program? <laughs> There's um, an application which you, you would submit uh, the application is reviewed uh, very carefully by a committee, and the goal of the review committee um, is to find a cohort which is well balanced geographically, by opinions, um, by experiences. Um, but we are assuming that the people who apply will all be eligible candidates to begin with. 